Hello, YouTube theologians. Pastor Brian Wolfmuller here, pastor of St. Paul Jesus Death Lutheran Church, and joined by Chad Bresson, who's pastor of the table down in North Mexico. <laughs> down <laughs> in the valley. It, yeah. Uh, we're and we've been talking about so we we were we're gonna be presenting together as part of an upcoming theological conference. If you're we're recording this because we figured that we are not going to have enough time to talk about all the things we want to at the conference. So we want to have a place for an extended conversation. So um, Chad, one of the reasons why we're both speaking together is because we both did not start theologically as Lutherans, but we ended there as Lutheran pastors. And the joy of that theology is the thing that we want to talk about, and especially around the topic of baptism. But tell, uh, so tell your story, um, how you got where you are, how you started and <laughs> I always say, how long do you have? <laughs> because it is a it is a long journey. And uh, you know, I I did not come into Lutheranism and and didn't really connect with St. Paul until I was about 52 years old. So uh this has been some kind of a journey and and it and it has been something that's brought a lot of joy to me and my family as well. Uh I, I I was born and raised in, in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, grew up in a Baptist home. It was I uh, went to a Calvinistic Baptist church, and those things are few and far between. But that's uh, that's the context in which I was raised, and so I grew up in in the Calvinistic and Reform world as a Baptist. Um, I got a degree at a Baptist college. It was a journalism degree. And broadcasting. So I was a broadcast journalist. I did that for almost 30 years uh, until uh, coming here to Texas. And I'll get to that in a second. But along the way, uh, I met my wife, Emily, and we've been married for 28 years. I always have to make sure I get that right. And Noel is 25 and Luke is 21. So we've got uh, two uh, two children and they live here in Los Fresnos, and Noel is in the publishing business, and Luke is at the university. So uh, we have a good time here in, in Los Fresnos as a family. And uh, the table is, as Brian mentioned, the table's uh, my passion. It's where God has placed us. We planted the table in 2018 and 2019. We launched our first worship service, uh, Word and Sacrament Ministry, in 2019. And then in 2021, we chartered as a congregation of the LCMS. And it's been a great, great, great journey. It's been a fantastic journey. You were telling um, me how you had this reformed influence, especially, but yeah. you started growing more and more dis disenchanted with that. Yeah. I'm I'm this I'm curious about that, but both like the theology and also the disenchantment and also like the differences. So once you started to I, I, you were telling me that someone said you were taught you were you preaching or present you were on the speaking was, right i was i was presenting so and someone became, said you sound like a lutheran and you're yeah, like what I did, are those right guys? <laughs> and what's funny is it it occurred that was uh in, that was in person online i had been engaging with people and then it, even around that same time it occurred two or three other times i began wearing that as a badge of honor but i didn't know what i was wearing <laughs> as a badge of honor just thinking hell oh, you know there must be something to this whole luther Thing. No, I did. I, I became disenfranchised with the reform world. And it was a 20 year period and a, and a 20 year journey really into this. I, I can remember, uh, again, I, I grew up in the Calvinistic environment, reformed environment. There was 1995, 1996. I was the leader of the singles group at our Baptist church. And I was struggling. I was, and I had been struggling for a long time. I saw people around me seem like all the time, just living these great Christian lives. And I wondered why it was so elusive for me. And I had entertained the idea of going to seminary, decided that I really needed to, to work on, on using my, my education, my degree. So I, I got a job in the Dayton area as a radio news director and, and did that for about 20 years. But also became a pastor in that time, but was just feeling like I was on this performance wheel and I couldn't get off. I was constantly trying to please Jesus, constantly thinking that God was out to get me. Jesus was out to get me. Jesus is constantly disappointed with me. And that just felt terrible. Um, it, it sucked. <laughs> and so 
I remember a night I was teaching on the cross. We were going through a study that had been prepared and it was using John Stott's Cross of Christ. And I'm reading John Stott's book. At the same time, I read a book by Michael Horton. Michael Horton's, his uh, journey is kind of like ours. He did not end up in, in Lutheran, in the Lutheran world. Not yet. But at the same yeah, right, not yet. Uh, I think Rod's still working on that. Um, he didn't end up here, but he had the same upbringing. So I, I, the stuff that he was saying uh, resonated with me about his disenfranchisement with his Baptist upbringing. Well, I'm sitting in my office at home studying uh, John Stott, reading John Stott, and he's going through what it, what imputation means, the idea that Christ's righteousness is imputed to us and that our sins are imputed to him, the, the, the great exchange. And of course, John Stott's reform, but the lads of light that's what probably one of the biggest light bulb moments in my life because i knew all about imputation i could tell you what it was i grew up with it i grew up with that idea you know i i taught it but something happened as i'm reading him and he he made the statement along the way that all of our sins have been imputed to jesus and he said past present and future in in his book and i just lost it i mean uh ever since then <laughs> I have been on this this just carpet, this magical carpet ride, a rocket ride uh, of trying to understand Christ's grace. And then it was through that lens, as I continued my study in the reform world, became a pastor, began teaching. I, I worked in the Simeon Trust Workshop universe, and that's a, the Simeon Trust Workshop is out of Chicago. It is a program and a series of workshops that are held around the country that help pastors work through the expositional process, teaching ex Bible exposition to pastors. Um, and I became a workshop leader in Chicago and in Columbus, and I've even done at least one here in Texas. So I uh, got involved in that. I was also involved in a, in a theological ex uh, education by extension program. Uh, I was actually a, an administrator and teacher in the theological uh, education by extension, church-based, and uh, was teaching in, in MDiv and uh, Master of Theology courses and programs there. And you had at and, this point like the sense of the imputation, the non-imputation. This, sins this and... sense, right? This sense, I began to realize that the way he was talking about, the way Stott was describing it, was not accept. We accepted it in the reform world, but we didn't teach it. Or it was like huh. the dirty little secret. It was just like, well, you know, we don't we don't really go there. Um, can can again, you? I, I so I, and I want to, but I got to. I just want to pull something in because so sure. A lot of people, especially the people who've grown up Lutheran, this I, the way you described the, this the angst of your of your Christian right. life. Like everyone else looks like it's great. I feel like I'm not even a Christian. And, and the it's a performance wheel and that Jesus is out to get me. Like Jesus is like, he's like the drill sergeant, right? And he's telling right. us what to do. And you step out of line and boy, and who knows, it's not, it's like a combination between like a drill sergeant and a disappointed overbearing. You father. have to keep, yeah, you have to keep that hamster wheel going because if it stops, then you must not be a Christian. So, so most I, I get my in my experience, most people who grew up Lutheran have no idea about that. Like, so you go to church and you hear the absolution, and it's whose whose sins are forgiven? Well, your sins are forgiven, and Jesus is kind and gentle and the Savior. And so, the idea of 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 that anxiety, right? Like, I want to be saved, but I'm pr I'm pretty sure Jesus isn't quite convinced of saving me yet. Can I, I just want to dig into that just a little bit more. Like, where, where do you think that comes from? How do you think it's perpetuated? <laughs> it is very hard for me. Yeah, where does that come from? I know where it comes from. Uh, and it's very hard for me to not name names. But in the reform world over time, and this has been true since Calvin. I mean, since I've walked through the Wittenberg door, I've now, you know, read the correspondence between Luther and Calvin and the Lutherans and the Calvinists, uh, be you know, before Luther's body is even cold and some of the stuff that was going down. And I immediately see 
oh, we're still having these same conversations 500 years ago because wow. in the reform, in the Luther was picking at this in Calvin. In the reform world, you end up with a work salvation that comes in the back door and it, and it works like this. The label that was given to it in the 80s, but one I grew up with even before the 1980s, it's called Lordship Salvation. And in Lordship Salvation, what you're doing is you're looking for fruit. Your fruit inspectors. Life becomes one big fruit inspection. And in Lordship Salvation, Lordship is you 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 accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need to make sure he's Lord. And, and they're bringing the two together that Savior and Lord are the same thing. So that when you are a Christian, you become a Christian, you're converted. You make that decision. That's also part of this whole thing. You are accepting Jesus as Savior and Lord. If your life doesn't look like you've accepted him as Lord, well, now it's we're free to question your salvation. And I was taught that from knee high, you know, from the time I was little, I could breathe. It's so, um, and it, it makes And in the 80s, it, it, it just exploded through this whole Lordship Salvation movement coming out. It's like out a of Southern Pharisee California. generation machine, you know? Like, how could you, like, can you think of a better way to build Pharisees that are whitewashed oh, tombs? So there's this pride on the outside and there's this despair on the inside. And Right, right. No, yeah, absolutely. It, there, there is this pride on the outside, despair on the inside. And the pride guys are running them up, <laughs> and there's a lot of despair going on in the pews. Um, but it is it it is. I came to think by the time I left the reform world, this whole this whole concept of constant fruit inspection to make sure that we're actually part of the kingdom um, was work salvation that had come in through the back door and. I grew up, uh, I mean, I went, I went to the conferences where sola, you know, the five sol the five solas in the reform world, five solas were preached and uh, embraced, but there's always this side thing that's taking all the grace away. <laughs> you hear the grace on the one side, but the moment you start going down the other road, they're going to, they're, they're immediately going to take the grace away. In other words, you're, you know, salvation is by faith alone, but Here's the other little thing. Sanctification is you're helping out the Holy Spirit here. Right. Synergism. <laughs> so you got this going. If this isn't going, then we have a right to question whether or not you, you know, just justification has occurred. If you can't see the sanctification, you can't see the justification. I, I have a theory on this, which I want to, I, I yeah, think go, I, go if ahead. I can remember, okay. I want to come this, back to it. Because sounds, I, yeah, I this think it's all part of the disenfranchisement because I was seeing this is not what the text is saying. I don't think you can defend grace alone apart from the sacraments because no, because our assurance <laughs> has to be outside of us. And if you lose that external assurance, then that, that creates faith, then you have to look for the external assurance of the things that faith creates, which is your works. So I can't look upstream to faith because there's nothing upstream. It's in my heart. So I have to look downstream of faith, but it's all, the problem is the water's muddy down there because it's all mixed with my own sinfulness. But, but before, so, so I got to get your idea on that theory, but I want to go back to something else you said, which I had not thought of before, because the thing that impressed you about imputation was not the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us, but rather the imputation first of sin. our sins to him. To him. Right. And I and that's how Psalm 32 does. It blesses a man to whom the Lord right. does not impute iniquity, which Paul brings into Romans. And I had, I had almost that had just never occurred to me. I, I don't know why. It's right there that before the, it's the gift of the righteousness. It's the gift of taking away that. Right. And right, that's right. the thing that struck you was that all of this belongs to him. Yep. 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 And he has me all the time. I mean, you talk about this tremendous weight that was taken off my shoulders in that moment. Uh, it's totally unbelievable. Um, I, I can't begin to describe the relief. Uh, and just thinking about this performance at wheel that I'd been on all this time, you know, in the Baptist world, they talk about victorious Christian living um, and wondering why I didn't have it. Well, you know what the dirty little secret is? Nobody has it. Uh, people are, you use the word Pharisees, people are deluding themselves into thinking that that's, that that's what's going on. You know, the other piece of this 
is along the way, as I study the scriptures, as I'm involved in the exposition of the scriptures and I'm studying these things, I came to a realization that uh, we needed this extra notice. That was great too. Coming through the Wittenberg door, the Lutherans actually had a name for what the external stuff that needed to happen to us. And while I, I became convinced that everything had to be external to us, justification, sanctification, and this progressive sanctification, we can get that to, get to that later. But what happens at the cross, well, that's fundamental to who we are and in our identity. And this word extra nos that Lutherans had all the time, I just was learning it differently. <laughs> we, we I came to so realize that there things. was actually a term for that, which I thought was really cool. It's like, I think for me, it was like discovering a whole nother continent. I'm like, who even knew that this stuff? So, but that, uh, I, uh, I, I was, that experience for me was this, is there was a time, I, I, it's a very, it was a, cause it was a, it was my own kind of in my head conversation. I can't even think of where I was in the world in my, like how old I was or where I was. But there was a point when I realized that Jesus actually wants to save me what <laughs> and that and it seems like the most obvious thing in the world you're like well yeah that's why he you know came down from heaven that's why he was went through all this rigmarole that's why he died you know and died and he did all this because he actually wanted to save me. To. and uh, and i realized that i had my whole life that had this idea well you know i would really like to be saved but jesus is like well i'm not sure i'm not right? sure about you you got to prove it. You got to win my affection. You and that is not it. free grace, you know. It is it's... not. And and there so now we're touching in on another problem is the whole repentance thing. Repentance mm -hmm. becomes an act. Right. Something you do. So let's lean you know, into that because you were reformed. Because repentance, I right, but I oh, <laughs> I even have this uh you know I've 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 written all these bullet points now but one of the big things that that fed this disenfranchisement was realizing that repentance is a gift and not something that we do that the reform world. And again, uh, <laughs> I'm going to have reform people that probably texted me later trying to uh, correct me on this, but yeah, that's right. They, <laughs> I, I do that too. Every time I say, I know, Hey, the reform, know, this I, is yeah, no, I've, you, you forgot yeah, to read I've, Westminster 7.2.9.7. I've, I've seen the, I've seen the comments on your Facebook. The, you forgot um, the footnotes on the this and that. Right. And, oh my! Goodness. But he, but here's the thing: repentance in the reform world is penance. It's Rome. It's Rome's oh, penance, gosh. being called something else uh, through the lens of sola fide. That isn't really sola fide because of lordship salvation. Um. It, it. But the repentance is penance. We're looking for proof. I just had a text from a, a friend of mine yesterday. She's she's also embraced Lutheranism in the last two or three years, uh, just part of this ongoing journey with us. And and she doesn't live here. She she lives in Ohio. But uh, talking about a situation that we know where somebody's being told they haven't repented enough, and I'm just like, oh my word! I've so been there. I've actually taught that in the Reform world. I wish I hadn't. Um, but when we start talking about and trying to look at whether somebody's actually repented enough, whether they're sincere enough, all of a sudden now we're, we're in Rome's territory yeah, that, and yeah, Luther that, actually said this, you know, Luther kept saying, stop trying to have people confess all of their sins all of the time because we're sinners and we don't know all the sin that we do. It's impossible. Yeah. Uh, Psalm 19, cleanse me from my hidden faults. Yeah. But there's this, like, anytime you put, so, so there is. Anytime you start to put it on the spectrum, you start to get into this dangerous spot. Like, all right, I, I remember it was always like, how how sincere are you? Well, like you surrendered your life to Jesus, but <laughs> did you surrender a hundred percent or ninety seven percent? You know, you let Jesus into your into the into the living room, but have you let him into the kitchen? Okay, okay, I'm going to let you in on a dirty little secret here. Even as Baptist teenagers, we used to drive the adults, even my parents, nuts because we would stand there in the pew. We knew this. We knew this as kids, that there was no really knowing what was enough. So that song that we would sing about once a month, once every couple months, I Surrender All, we'd sit, we'd stand in the pew and there'd be a bunch of us in that, in that line uh, as teenagers singing, 
I surrender some. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it drove them nuts, but that was true. It I was true. Some. How can you surrender all? I mean, it's like <laughs> if it's up to me to do it's it's like, okay. Hey, well, I, th there's this weird inversion of the free will that happens, right? Because, right. Yep. like, yep. I, as a Baptist or as a free will theologian, as a as a as a member of the church that's been revivalized, let's say that that has these revival right. traditions, right. I have the free will to surrender my heart to God and become a Christian, yep. but I don't have a free will to determine like what I should have for dinner or where I should go to school. Like I have to pray and fast to figure out like what color socks to wear, but I have a free will to choose who my savior is. It's completely inverted. So the Lord does give us some degree of freedom to on the things below. It's the things above where he says, no, look, to be an unbeliever means that you don't believe. So, so I have to give that to you. And so that everything start to begin, start to end alpha to omega yeah. Yeah. Uh, is he, he, he is the author not just of our salvation, but of our faith that clings to the promise of salvation. But it's so that weird reversal of the of the will does two things, I think. And so I want to maybe have you lean into this. The, 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 when we go into the revivalized church, it's like you you have the decision, you have a free will to choose Christ, to surrender your life to him, to accept Jesus into your heart. But that free will of yours needs a lot of encouragement to do the right thing. <laughs> and And that idea of the free and yet palsied or sick will leads to a style of worship and conversation that is from our angle we can see it right it's a hundred percent manipulation oh absolutely i gotta coax you into doing these things oh yeah um and we're gonna stay here until you actually make the decision you need to make <laughs> i've been in those i've been in those situations too here's the other thing that's going in that's going on here and this is also part of my disenfranchisement the implicit and sometimes explicit denial of the symbol. Ah, okay. The reason we don't have, a, you know, you and I both know, the reason we don't have a free one when it comes to things above is because we're still sinners. I mean, the old Adam never choose. That old Adam doesn't exist for a lot of people in the reform world that we are saints. In fact, I was in, I was in a context for about 20 years uh, as a pastor I was really the only, it was a plurality of pastors, and there was only a couple of us that really uh, believed the simile. And even had, we had some conversations around the pastor's table from time to time, and it became obvious that I was in a big minority, but we're just saints. We shouldn't be telling people they're sinners. We are yeah. now saints. Yeah, feel, so fill that out. What do you, when you say simile, what do you mean? If someone's saying, what's the simile? Uh, simile, who's the Zephpecator? You know, the, the saint yet sinner. Um, we're it's not 50 50 it's like 100 100 <laughs> we're where we have got the old adam at the same time as we're new creations in christ both existing at the same time well i was taught as a kid that once you became a christian that you no longer had what they called it the old nature new nature in, in the baptist circles no longer had the old nature now it's just the new nature and you would do some really funky things with Romans 7. I've seen some, some bizarre explanations of Romans 7 in the reform world by some pretty brilliant guys. And again, I'm, I'm not going not gonna to name names, uh, theolo big theologians that are in the Chicago area, but <laughs> um, the idea that the Sarks there is, is just the flesh. And we can somehow just talk about the flesh as being that's where the sin is, but it's not really the person. Um, and it's just the flesh. That's a denial of the symbol, that the idea that we're still sinners. And I felt a, a whole lot more freedom, even in my own reformed understanding of this, thinking about myself as both sinner and saint. While I was watching all these people struggle, they're supposed to be saints wondering why they still sin. But of course, there's also a little bit of implicit perfectionism going on. No, they're not Pentecostals. But I did have guys sitting around me and preaching around me that uh, if if we lived for 10,000 years, it's probably possible where sin could be completely eradicated. How, what do they think that the sin comes from? So I'm so it's just a new nature. So is it just my physical nature? It's like your physical. Well, OK, so now you're leaning into the whole Gnosticism stuff. Right. 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 Um, the physical is evil. The physical is where the sin is. The physical. And on again, you, that you 
they're they're playing word games with the word flesh right so, flesh so let's, is still us I, I remember reading there's a line in the is it it's in the formula of concord it's like the first sentence in the second article or maybe it's the first or third right in there and it says i bet it's the second it says we have to distinguish between the different states of man's will before the fall, after the fall, after conversion, and after the resurrection. And that was a mind-blowing thing to me. Right. And 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 so to have the chart and have it worked out, but to say, look, before the fall, Adam and Eve could sin, apparently. They could also not sin. They had that freedom. But after the fall, all you can do is sin. But then, and after the resurrection, so skip three to go to four, <laughs> right. you won't be able to sin. Non posse, non, non posse peccarum, not possible right. to sin. But then that third, how is it for the Christians? And most Christians think, well, it's like a return to the garden. You can sin or not sin. Like you're you right. you're good, but you're not perfect. But but and, uh, well, and this is why Luther called them enthusiasts because they were they they have this theology of the Holy Spirit, their pneumatology. I I, I say it's over realized pneumatology, where the spirits enabled me into that that equilibrium so mm -hmm. to speak in the garden mm -hmm. where i can choose a sin i can't choose a sin the spirit's gonna help me not to choose a sin blah 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 but and, and it's I'm just all, it it's all me everything is now me it's me. this wrestling <laughs> whereas the bible romans 7 tells us well how is it for us after the fall well i still have the old adam which can only sin the flesh and i have the new man which can only serve god and I have both, and they're fighting. The the spirit and the and the flesh are at war with one another. That's not the soul spirit distinction. And so this is so important. The soul body distinction is not the flesh spirit distinction. So right. The, so so I do I do righteous things. And here's maybe the whole point that we should press to is I have a, already the foretaste of what Paul calls the spiritual body. In the resurrection, we'll have a spiritual body. I have a foretaste of that. My body does holy things like it hears God's word. That's a holy thing that my ear does. And it receives the gift of baptism. That's a holy thing that my hair does or my head. I, I eat the body and blood of Jesus. That's a holy thing that my mouth does. And I do very sinful things also in my soul, like distrust God, complain about his you know, chastisement or whatever. So that the flesh and spirit are fighting, and that's different than the soul body. And and that is so important because that lets us that lets us see that God is working on us from the outside. Now, and that was the key, I think that was the key thing for you. The, 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 the right. extra nose discovery. We have to have it. Yeah. We have to have it because we're still sinners. Um, what's interesting is this also plays into how the, you know, the death death and all that is is talked about um celebration of life oh yeah uh again uh <laughs> i know there's going to be people watching this even in our own world lutheran world that that use that term and, and that's okay i've 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 done done celebration of life services i prefer that not based on what i come from and we call them celebration of life services because uh it's almost a denial of the fact that what is in front of us or if the urn is there what whatever is in front of us the body or the urn um we were told that that's not really joe yeah crazy what you know Gnostic that's not really craziness again it's more more gnosticism but <laughs> there was this everything is so spiritualized that the right. real you goes to be with jesus and then at some point you're going to get a brand new shell right this is just a shell but this is all part of the whole simul discussion, the whole part of the body soul thing, the whole part of wills and which will is working when and all this stuff. And, and when you spiritualize everything, when the Holy, when you've got this pneumatology and the whole, again, I don't mean to denigrate the Holy Spirit. He is vital, but the Holy Spirit is constantly working through the externals. Right. Um, instead of all this navel gazing and the internal stuff that goes on. And be, because we have all this navel gazing and internal stuff that goes on then. And, well, sure. When we die, I want to highlight the fact that I'm, you know, that the the real me is going to heaven. The spiritual me is going to heaven. That this okay. body was never was never good to begin with. It's been wrecked by sin. We don't need it anymore. 
It's so crazy. Very, very I mean, Gnostic. It's, I, I remember I was standing by a casket with a daughter a morning, and she looked down at her mother's body there in the casket, and she said, well, mom's gone. She's not here. And I and I want to yeah. say, well, what's that? <laughs> it's like that body it's true that the soul is with is with christ but it's true that the body is that those are the hands that that held you you know right. that's this is yeah. the, this is your this mom is so, yeah <laughs> and that body right there in the casket is gonna be raised forever that this casket is going to be as empty as the tomb of jesus one day uh so so there's this gnosticism that it i, I it would be an amazing sort of thing is just to say to make a chart and on this side you have gnostic gnostic results and on this side you just list the doctrines original creation original sin <laughs> incarnation redemption justification yeah. sacraments church pneumatology funeral sir eschatology and you see all the results and the results of that is evangelicalism right like why right. can't baptism save you well because it's stuff and that means it must be a work and we know works don't save so that every time a reformed person is arguing that baptism doesn't save they're not anywhere in the neighborhood of a text about baptism they're always in the grace alone texts as if that answers the question it's it's like can you not see your gnostic implications here well, it's even worse than that, especially when it, well, not just baptism, it's also in the Lord's table. I know I'm I'm supposed to be highlighting baptism, but it's both. It's worse than that. It's not just a work that we do. God doesn't use earthly elements to save us. Right. That is so old school, Old Testament, and that doesn't happen because the earth is, is sinful or it's it's dirty. It's It's not something God would use. God is only interested in the spiritual, the real stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so he doesn't use water. He doesn't use wine. He doesn't use sound waves. He doesn't use bread. Uh, he it, It's all spiritual. And so all those passages that are talking about baptism or even alluding to water or whatever, that just is all talking about stuff that's going on to me spiritually. So I'm no, it's no wonder that we get to end of life. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, this isn't Joe. This is just a shell. Well, we've been t teaching ourselves that all along. Um, now, I've gotten to the point, even in these celebrations of life and funerals, memorial services, whatever, I never let that opportunity to go by without now saying, you know, now that I'm in this context, it's okay to cry. Oh, yes. Death is bad. Yes. Death is not a good thing. It's okay to cry. It's okay to be you know, kind of sad. It's okay to also be angry sometimes. Uh, this is not natural. Um, yes, this is a transition from, you know, this, this life into the next stage or whatever you want to call it, but we still have to embrace the fact that when God created the world, there was no death. Right. And we have death now because of sin. It's okay to cry. It's okay to be sad. I'm not, we're, we don't run from that. Right. Jesus, who did everything right, wept at Lazarus. Lazarus death. too. Right. It's a good work right. to weep. And we, can we say this? How about here's my definition of grief, <laughs> uh, which I never have heard anybody. So I, you could you should correct me on this. Grief is the shape that love takes when the object of our love is absent. Yeah, I heard you say that. That is absolutely right. Oh, yep. Right. I heard I heard you say that. Oh, right. so, right. now so, so we at the end the beginning i want to i want to push back to how this came clear to you the extra the this the power of the externos of the word and of baptism how you got to that like how, how did that discovery take place i would say again so again i was coming out of an acts 29 work i was an executive pastor here in the brownsville area I was coming out of that work, um, again, dissatisfied. I'd had some conversations both in that context, was having some online discussions, and, and internally, I'm, I'm not back where I was in the 90s, but vocationally, I'm just, I'm, I'm not, I'm thinking I'm just, this isn't my world, or I'm constantly swimming that stream. Things seem to be harder than they need to be when it comes to why am I constantly uh, having this conversation about how how does sanctification work or 
um, even law gospel antithesis, which is another thing I had embraced along the way. Um, why am I always having to have the conversation? So when we were leaving that world and I was in between jobs, so to speak, I was actually uh, a candidate for a church in Phoenix and in the reform world. And I just was not settled in my heart. Uh, I made it, I, I was the candidate. In fact, it was, and just, to, we were making plans to to visit Phoenix and to meet the people there. And I just, and I told Emily, I, my wife, I just said, you know, I'm not, I'm just not feeling this. I'm going to say, if it's okay with you and we're, <laughs> I'm without a job. So we're walking away from money. And I say, is it, if it's okay with you, I want to tell them no, but I want to be in agreement. You know, I want this to be a, I want this to be us that it's okay that yeah, I'm unemployed and I'm going to tell this church that could provide for our family. I'm going to say, I'm, I'm not coming. And she said, that's fine. We will continue to look here. And so I did, I sent them the the email and bowed out of that situation and it was about that same time we were starting to visit churches here. And there was another uh, Acts 29 work in Harlingen. They liked that work there. And I, I knew the pastor. I know Jeff. And he's a great guy. Um, I was also going to, we were also going to visit Covenant Presbyterian here in Harlingen. And because that's what we knew. But I'd, along the way, had been reading Lutherans online. And it was resonating with me. And I'm I'm beginning to think, maybe we should try this. So I looked it up online and there was a there were church church in Harlingen has had a contemporary service and that was important for my family and my kids. So uh, we decided we were gonna visit. Well, our visit didn't wasn't really the the uh, a, a service. We went to the Christmas service. They were having a big Christmas service at, at the academy that they had at the time, uh, December of 2016. And as big as 1995 was, this takes the cake. Going to that Christmas service in 2016, Pastor Nathan Wendorf and St. Paul having their Christmas service there. And I was absolutely blown away. I heard more gospel in Nathan's 12 or 15 minute sermon um, than I had heard probably two or three years of sitting in various pulpits. Um, it was amazing. He did confession absolution. <laughs> I won't tell you what I was thinking. It was kind of funny. Uh, but because I, I, I was like, what the heck? <laughs> Who's that guy think he is? <laughs> right. Um, and, 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 but because I had been reading Lutherans online, knowing that what was going on wasn't Catholic, right? It, it wasn't what I had been trained or taught that that what was going on there. Um, and so that was our experience. Uh, and that was the first experience in Lutheran. And, and internally, I was just like, oh, wow, this is so awesome. This, I think, is what I'm looking for. Now, about th two or three weeks later, we finally visited one of the services at St. Paul. And again, it just res the whole thing resonated with me. And this time with <laughs> confession absolution, I'm just like, uh, this is great. Found myself always wanting to come back. We were still visiting some other churches, but always wanting to go back to St. Paul so I could hear Nathan do it again. I wanted that. Extra notice is already having an effect on me in a big way. And uh, Nathan was great too. <laughs> we tell this story. Uh, so I think it was like that second or third week into January or whatever, you know, we're shaking the pastor's hand as we, we leave the sanctuary. And, and uh, this uh, pastor Nathan says, Hey, uh, maybe we should get together for, for breakfast or lunch. And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. And, and I didn't think, you know, you, you visit these churches and as a visitor, you think, yeah, that's what the pastor is supposed to say. <laughs> no, he actually did it. <laughs> and um, so he invites me to breakfast at uh, Lonnie's there next to the church. It's a it's a breakfast place, uh, brunch place. 
And he listens to my story. He's listening to everything you're listening to now. And he gets, we get toward the end of it. And he's just, he's like, there's some things you should do. There's some things that I, I'd like you to think about and check out or whatever. But he, along the way says, I really think you should read the book of Concord. <laughs> I think it'll resonate with the things that you're saying. And I was just like, well, oh, okay. And I didn't I haven't really heard of the book of Concord. I knew knew about the Augsburg Confession and kind of read a little bit of it, but this book of Concord, I hadn't really I hadn't really dove into that at all. And Nathan now says he can't remember ever in a first visit with anybody ever telling him to read the book of Concord. Uh, but I did. Brian, all that stuff. I mean. I'm sitting here in my office and I am weeping over the book Concord. It's the best thing I've ever, I'm making my way through the confession. I'm making my way through the Augsburg apology. I, oh man, blown away. Well, as Melanchthon and, you know, Luther are talking about forgiveness and forgiveness and forgiveness and forgiveness and forgiveness. All the extra no stuff that we've been talking about is just right there. And I'm just blown away. And one of the things that I was doing internally, again, I'm just a geek. I do this. <laughs> Every time that Melanchthon or Luther would start talking about justification or salvation, I would insert the word sanctification because wow. of my because of my context. Wow. Because of where I'm coming from. Yeah. Again, weeping moments. This is what I've been saying about sanctification and salvation the whole time. One of the things that Reformed people do, and we've done it in our systematic theologies. We've been doing it for years. I was part of all that and as we taught it. The sanctification, the Reformed are big on ordo salutis, right? The golden mm -hmm. chain of how salvation works. You've got uh, the pull of the Spirit, and then you've got justification, sanctification, uh, glorification, yeah, you know, all this stuff, and it's it's all in, in its order, the order of salvation. Sanctification sitting there in the order of salvation via Romans. But what we like to do because of all the synergy involved, because of all the work that we're doing in sanctification, because it's all on us, we pull that thing out and park it over here as its own little deal. I brought this up in Dayton probably 15 years ago in a conversation with us pastors at the table. I was like, we really talking about sanctification and salvation because salvation is, I understand it is nothing we do. Oh, well, we're really talking about sanctification is transformation. <laughs> I was like, well, maybe we should just talk about transformation then not sanctification. Sanctification is part of the Ordo Salutis. Right. Right. Um, when I was first ordained in the reform world, I actually got in trouble. Oh, I thought I, I thought they weren't going to ordain me. I mean, in the Baptist world, he's sitting in front, in front of a bunch of your peers. I think we should do and, this, by the way, in the Lutheran church too. But And all, you know, all the peers get to answer, ask you questions. And they come mm -hmm. from all over the region to, to ask you these questions to make sure you're one of them or whatever. I made the comment that uh, we have been saved. We are being saved. We will be saved. Mm -hmm. And that brought the house down. This is 15 years ago. I mean, remember, these guys are saying, hey, you're Lutheran before you're Lutheran. <laughs> but now I'm reading the book of Concord. It's all there. It's great. They had, they, had this, they had these arguments. It was all done 500 years ago between Luther and Calvin. They had these arguments. I'm having the same arguments all the time. And it's just tearing me up because I feel like I'm not really doing any ministry, but uh, just operating in a world that isn't really like what I believe or what I think the text is saying. And here it's right in front of me. Unbelievable. The book of Concord. Now I'm in <laughs> that little, little thing that's going on internally. Now I'm mad at God. Why am I 52 years old now reading this? Mm -hmm. It's a 500 year old document and I'm 52. Why didn't I know this at 22? And mm -hmm. I had to resolve that, you know, obviously God uses all these things. Right. Um, that that's a tough but, thing by the way i've just to kind of put a little flag there is that w when you're coming into something like all you start to regret all the past and you're repenting of all the old errors and it's a great thing to see how the lord was bringing you through it so now so this, okay. i don't mean to i should i should put a caveat in there 
I don't mean to blur when I do when I say I'm switching out sanctification. I don't mean to blur the lines between justification and sanctification because that can happen too. There's a danger that the, the Rome does that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but what I what I want us to see is that sanctification is salvation in action, mm -hmm. and it's extra nose. Wow, that's great. So, so Book of Concord, and you're like, wow. Here's the thing, right. but then there's the tricky business of <laughs> baptism and baptism. especially infant baptism. Right. Okay. Right? So, right. So that's that's even why we're doing this. We're finally to it. What? <laughs> um, Who's counting? That's why we're doing this. So we yeah, don't right. have to pay attention so, to the clock. Uh, right. So Pastor Wendorf, I hear him along the way. He's talking about baptism and he's using the re regeneration language. I knew this again. Uh, I'm 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 no fool. I've been around been around a while. I know this is in the Lutheran um formulas and all and i'm thinking okay baptism or regeneration and he talks about it from time to time and i'm still operating kind of in a reform lens as it comes to baptism like one of the things that horton did for me listening to white horse in all those years is that baptism is being done to you oh good I couldn't quite figure that couldn't quite figure that out in the context i was in but at least with the table the lord's supper I had firmly come to believe that, that, that the table is doing something to us. Again, couldn't explain everything that was going on. Like, what is it doing to us? Well, it's doing something to us um, that know quite what, but we should stop talking about it as we bring, you know, we come to the table and then we beat ourselves up because we're, uh, we're constantly trying to figure out if we're worthy or not. Same thing with baptism too. It, obedience. Okay. I can see the obedience part and we're talking about obedience in the Baptist context. But Horton's saying baptism is is done to you. Uh, it's coming from outside to you. Now, for him, it's still just grace. Um, so I already had that. And so I'm willing to entertain Pastor Nathan talking about the things that baptism does in various sermons and so forth. But then, you know, entering into the entering into the Lutheran Church, which happened, I think, a few months later. I thought I've got to I've got to sit down again as, as a serious theologian as a, as a as pastor and it, I was already having thoughts how am I going to be a pastor in the Lutheran Church don't know how I'm going to do that but that's what I'm going to do. Um, so if I'm going to do this, I need to seriously consider the whole baptism question. Let me so let, let me I've push to, you to it aside. So so there's a weird thing that is it's this is a this is a point of that's difficult for Lutherans to understand about the Reformed, and it's difficult for the Reformed to understand about the Lutherans, and that is the place that the doctrine of the sacraments holds in our in our dogmatics. Right. So so we can just constantly as, be talking past one another, and and we understand the Lutherans understand that that um, the sacraments are an essential doctrine. The Reformed do not. Like you can have a uh, you can have a Reformed Baptist that refuses to baptize babies, and a Reformed right. Presbyterian that does baptize babies, or you can have a Reformed Baptist that says the supper is just a memorial meal, and you have a Reformed, say Presbyterian who says that the the supper is a is a the real presence. The, you commune with the spiritual divine presence of Christ or whatever. Right. It's not a memorial meal. It's a real presence. So, but you they say we're still Reformed because. In the Reformed system, you have salvation here, and the sacraments are to the side. They are, uh, yes. and and so they are they are considered non-essential doctrines. They're considered even places where you can have different opinions. I mean, I you you can't probably be a Baptist and want to baptize babies, but in other words, they are they are not con they are not connected to salvation. No, so that, not in not in any not in any way, shape, or form. Now, the, uh, and again, I don't. This will, it'd be very easy to tra go down this rabbit hole, but there are big differences between Baptists and Presbyterians when it comes to this, in terms of what they are doing. Baptists, as a step of obedience for baptism, baptism is something we do. It is a step of obedience, mm -hmm. but it is not. It is not something that is necessary for salvation. Uh, at the same time, because of Lordship salvation, if you, d if you do not want to be baptized, well, then you were never saved to begin with, because if you were really saved, you'd want to be baptized, you know, mm -hmm. that, that kind of a thing. So I grew up with that. 
And in the Presbyterian world, it's a, it, it does provide us grace. So you'll see in the reform, the, the, the Westminster and some of the other confessions, they talk about that uh, baptism doesn't save, but it does provide daily graces um, to us in our lives or whatever. So it's talked about that way. Um, but there's big distinction. I mean, it is a, it is a whole, it's, it's now another level to talk about it in terms of uh, it actually being part of salvation, which is why, again, as a Baptist, and I know Presbyterians that talk this way too. When you're talking about Lutherans, there are many areas where Lutherans would be embraced in the evangelical world, but the moment you bring up baptism is the moment, okay, you're not, you're you're out. So I was even part of that. That I grew up with that too. Lutherans are still too Catholic when it comes to the way they think about baptism. Um, so anyway, that's yeah, that is an aside. <laughs> <laughs> is it why? Because and we think well, baptism. It's and Lord's Supper. It's what. In fact, we define the church that way. It's right. where the gospel is no, preached right. and the sacraments are administered. Are administered. Right. And so we have this very. I mean, for us, it's like there's it's nothing more central than yeah. the sacraments. And for the Reformed, it's like it, they think about the sacraments like we think probably about the end times. Like <laughs> we have a doctrine of the end times. We think it's, a, we think this is right from the scriptures, but it's, it's not like, that's not what we're going to talk about all the time, but that's how to they, be, they, to be fair to some of my Presbyterian friends, some of them probably would be a little more firm about the necessity of making sure that that child, you know, one of the things baptism does, especially infant baptism too, is it brings the child into the covenant, uh, which is the church. Right. So what you're doing, if you don't baptize your child as Presbyterian, well, you're denying your child entry into the church. Um, so they make a distinction between being part of the church. Which, uh, this is all part of this, this, this journey I'm on because I'm seeing uh, a yellow flag there. <laughs> How can you say they're part of the covenant and they're part of the church, but they're not saved? Right. Hmm. So what? So, okay. wow. so, so, yeah. so how did it click for you? Cause so, so okay. you're starting to so fight I've got through a, this. I've got a whiteboard. I got a, it's in my office. It's down here on the, on the floor. And I took that thing again, another one of these amazing, just unbelievable. I was weeping by the end of it all. Um, again, as a, as someone who had studied the scriptures and knew what the scriptures were on the left side of the whiteboard, I just started writing the, here, here are the passages. So, you know, you, you start with, you know, Matthew 3, and then you've got Mark 1, you've got Mark 16, Acts 2, you got Acts 22, um, you've got uh, 1 Peter 3, obviously, but then you also have Romans 6 and Colossians, Ephesians, see, that, that list of them all. And one of the things that I did before I, as I listed them all, then one of the things that I did, because I realized over time that this was a big part of my hermeneutic of baptism, and I had used it to, con as well as hermeneutical, gym hermeneutical gymnastics, which I've done <laughs> forever on the baptism issue. But one of the big arguments against baptism itself being salvific is well, what about the infants that as, as if that's a hermeneutic mm -hmm. so what i did was recognizing as someone who has taught exegesis that that's not really an argument that's not really exegesis that that's something else that's a theological question that's not an exegetical question i probably should park that outside this whole discussion for now i'm not gonna i'm not gonna allow what about the infants? It's almost like its own what aboutism. You know, Baptists are <laughs> some of the biggest what about us uh, that I know. What about infant baptism? I'm going to park that to the side. We're just going to look at what are these passages saying about baptism? The other thing, we've already talked about this, that I'd also decided that I'm going to run with what this these passages are saying about baptism i'm going to include some things here because i already begun to suspect something that you bring up and has american christianity failed use the word stuff that jesus uses stuff and i called it earthly elements jesus uses the earth god uses the earth 
in salvation. I'd begun to suspect that that was true. So I was going to not necessarily park it, but recognize where that's in this whole thing. So I listed all the passages. And then I started listing all the things that these passages are telling me is going on with baptism. And when I was done and I took a step back and looked at the whiteboard and looked at that list on the right side, I just couldn't believe it. And my first thought was, oh, my word, it's everywhere. That was my first thought. It's pervasive in the text. It's been in front of me this whole time. And because of presuppositions and because of the way I was trained to think, I didn't see it. But you just start going down the list. Forgiveness, forgiveness, the Holy Spirit, regeneration, the new birth, as John 3, it's also in that list. Washing, being united to Christ, being united to his people. And then 1 Peter 3, obviously, saved. Yeah, that's a whole list. Are you kidding me? This is what baptism does. And I was just, I was beside myself. It's an unbelievable moment. And it was because I had this thing, this what about infants? And the other one, the big one, the Lutherans make fun of this one. But, you know, what about the thief on the cross? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the other hermeneutical principle you, you're, that, that I knew and were trained, um, if you've been in any expositional uh, classes, you've been trained as a pastor, as you know, that you, if there's one verse that says one thing and you've got 250 verses saying something else, then that one verse better fit the 250 rather than rewriting the 250 to match the one. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. And then... Again, remember, Jesus uses stuff. Jesus uses the earth. Just It went through my head. It wasn't on that whiteboard. But when I'm looking at that whiteboard, I'm now thinking about the story of Naaman in the Old Testament. You know, and I know they're different. God uses different things for different people in these light bulb moments. And for many of them, it's understanding the Exodus as a baptism. And it is, by the way. It's, it's absolutely glorious. The, the flood, 1 Peter 3, Noah and the ark. <laughs> baptism for me it was Naaman because I went to I went to second kings and I'm reading that passage you know what comes out of Naaman's mouth why would God have me do something in the dirty Jordan when he can just that man of God can just say the words that's exactly what we say as Baptists (laughs) why would God use earth he can just do it he can just save you he doesn't need all this stuff (laughs) Oh, my word. And so I was just like, okay, I don't know how this at the time. I don't know how the infant thing is going to fit back in. And I kind of suspected I knew how, but I was at least now. (laughs) I'm at least partway through. I almost like the Church of Christ where they've got baptismal regeneration in their grid. Only it's a work that they do, by the Mm -hmm. way. (laughs) Um, I'm at least there. But this whole baptismal regeneration thing. Okay, I'm it. This is me. I'm not, I don't question it anymore. Um, and man, oh man, since then, Ephesians 5. I, I know, that's. I think that's the key text. Oh, Christ Ephesians is the five. one who does the washing. It's not our work, it's, it's his not, work. Right. Remember how Horton was saying, it's something done to you? Oh yeah. yeah. Only it's a whole lot bigger than Horton will admit. Yeah. He's it's washing so you. He's preparing you. He's giving you. In that in that washing, that was also by Ephesians 5. He's giving you holiness. Right. There's the sanctification. Bit. Right, right. Cleansing the church. Oh my word. And and then of course the explicit stuff, you know, <laughs> the conversation between Ananias and Paul. Once you set aside your presuppositions, you're like, oh my word, it gets buried. Ab- Acts 22, when Ananias tells Paul, you know what? Before you go see those guys and you start talking about, hey, this conversion event, you better go get baptized. And he says, you need to go wash yourself for the forgiveness of your sins. Mm -hmm. He says, wash for the forgiveness of sins. That that text is just buried. 
I didn't even know that text really existed until just a few years ago. Isn't that amazing? You're like, how many times have I read this? Right? And it's just right. Right. Because you have the sunglasses on, right? You're like, I everything is my it, the, the Gnostic sunglasses makes this if it's physical, it's a work, so it can't save. So that yeah. particular passage, I think you're touching on something that happens to us psychologically too. I mean, it, it's just we suppress it and then we forget it. And so when when we're reading through Acts 22, like in our daily Bible readings throughout the year or whatever, we just run right through it. It doesn't even occur to us. This is what's happening because we've just kind of suppressed that thought like, no, that can't be it. That's not what's going on here. This is something else. What? what you know, and I, I, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, no. No, I'm just talking about the hermeneutical gymnastics that we did. That, that so I, I want to do the years. opposite. So what happens psychologically when that when the scales fall off and you start to see, oh, baptism? Okay. Remember that event in 1995? That was still kind of a spiritual event, right? <laughs> Maybe it was. It was the Christ using his word. It was sacramental. He was using his word. He's using John Stott. He's using that to, to tell me that, you know, use imputation in my context, my experience to just kind of to bring me into a place of understanding grace. But this baptism bit then made all of that make sense. You talk about cl everything clicking into place. Now all of it makes sense. The journey makes sense. The last wow. 20 years spinning makes sense. Wow, wow, wow. Baptism. That was the key. Baptism. It all. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It all makes sense now. I don't have to do it. And, and I started feeling bad. And I do. I mean, I, I do. I genuinely feel bad uh, because, you know, since then, I've had people tell me that they feel as if I betrayed them because of the stuff that I've taught about baptism in the past. I get that. I understand that. Um, so, but this extra nose idea uh, made everything make perfect sense. No more gym, hermeneutical gymnastics. Um, I can, you know, that was the other presupposition too, by the way, that's in the Lutheran grid that I picked up early from Nathan. Um, and that was that Lutherans take a lot of this, this stuff kind of a little bit more seriously. They're not quite literalists. And I always fought against literalism in the Baptist world because literalism was what gave us, uh, you know, all the end times baloney. And you can really get messed up if you're not recognizing the, the genres, the conversations, you know, sim symbolism, all the stuff going down. You can't take everything literally. But when I'm what I'm seeing in the Lutheran hermeneutic is a consistent use of of the literal so that when this says baptism now saves you, you know what? He's actually saying that. I, it was for me. I remember we were at a Calvary Chapel, and the and the preacher oh, yeah. Skip Heitzig, and he was talking about how we read the Bible literally. We read the Bible literally, and then he uh, he said, "Okay, now we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper." And he read, "This is my body." He said, "Now we don't take that literally." It right. was same service, right. and I was like, same, and, right. "And that was probably the moment." I'm like, "Well, why not?" And oh, yeah. are there people who believe this? And so that that's an amazing thing, actually. To, by the way, dirty little secret. I, I I'm one of the I'm in the minority on this, and I I get why you know Luther said what he said, and I get why this hasn't been big. John six is a big Eucharistic passage for me, but it is because of the literalism. In fact, it's the <laughs> you know that's the response of the crowd. Oh, he's talking about can cannibalism. Well, of course he's not talking about that. Right. Jesus answers that question right there. But all that to say is. That was refreshing. It was a relief. The literalism, um, and it's not literalism, just just taking the the statements that this is my body, uh, right. this is my blood, this is baptism, and and understanding it's for me. That's also going on in the text. Boy, wasn't that a big light bulb moment as well? I never saw for me, uh, for for the forgiveness of sins and for the many in those. Uh, Eucharistic passages in that in the Synoptic Gospels. Um, I never saw that before. Now I do. Now I say it every Sunday. That's what jazzes me. I mean, that's <laughs> this now, is the now, greatest. But still, so okay. So infants was aside, but now you at some point you got to bring the babies in. All right. So oh, one more thing before we get there because yeah, this sure. is connected to the baby thing. 
Now, I again, cutting my teeth on exposition. It's what exposition, by the way, is why I'm in Texas, because I knew the uh, Simeon Trust stuff and was a workshop leader. They were using that material here at a mission agency in Los Fresnos, and they were training missionaries on doing Bible exposition in the field. And there was a curriculum that had been developed in, in, for international pastors and all. And so I knew all that curriculum. So that's how I ended up being hired uh, to come down here. So that's kind of, that's just what I enjoy doing. So I went to 1 Peter 3. And once you know it, there's a parallelism going on with the Kyanism. You know what's sitting in the middle? The ark and baptism are sitting in the middle of it all. I mean, it was like neon neon lights that we're supposed to see in the story of Noah and the Ark. The baptism saves. So that I mean, again, just that's a side note. But okay, so then the next thing is Acts two, Acts two thirty eight through forty is also a mini chiastic structure within this is parallelism going on. That middle verse is what we're supposed to see. Now we spend a lot of time on repent and be baptized for the forgiveness. Of, that is a big deal, right? Now, we don't de don't deny that's not a big deal. You know what the main point of that, that structure is? It's promises for you and your children. And you talk about hermeneutical gymnastics. And I'm seeing this, I'm seeing this kind of, and I'm just like, oh my word, it's right. In, you know, it's right in front of me again. Mm -hmm. um, Baptists and I think Presbyterians uh, as well. Look at that passage. And when they say for the promise, what they really mean is that the offer of salvation is for you and your children. That's not what Dr. Luke is, is saying there. That's not what Peter's saying. That's not how Luke is recording it. Luke is recording it in a way that we see that Peter is saying the promise. The promise. Salvation mm -hmm. is for you and your children mm -hmm. and those who are afar off. Again, I'm just like, oh, okay. There this it is, is, right in front of you. Right, right, right in front of me. I've been in that verse many, many times. Yeah. In fact, I knew how to handle, I knew the hermeneutical gymnastics we did that repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, the translator is used for, but it's it's really because um, of. is it's of. Yeah. Uh no, 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 no. We understand that pulling of in there is only they can only I think. In Greek manuscripts, they can only find like maybe one instance of that ha ever happening or something like that. It's not normal. Do you, I remember I I did that. <laughs> I, I so when I was becoming again, I was at the Calvary Chapel. I went to I listened to I would get these passages where there was the disputed things, John twenty, right, Acts right. two, all this stuff, and I got the Acts two lecture, and he said in Greek the word here, uh, for can also be translated because of. And here's an example of that translation. And he read some Bible passage that translated be baptized because of the forgiveness of sins. I didn't know Greek at the time. So I went and I looked at ice and it's used, it's probably used like 10,000 times in the, in the <laughs> new Testament or something. And it's, and it's translated because of like, maybe it's an option in one place. It means for into. Right. So I went and I got the translation that translated it because of, and and I had to interlibrary loan it. It was some obscure translation. And it came and I opened it up. And the first words of preface is, this is not a translation from the Greek. It is a <laughs> theological paraphrase. And I'm like, okay. Now that is a lot of work to get the text to say something different than what it looks like it says. Oh, well, there's a, that's another like one of those side hermeneutical principles. If it takes you uh, two hours to explain of something in the text that's probably not what the text means if you can <laughs> i know right. and, and i'm i'm obviously exaggerating because we will argue over these things for more than two hours and what what texts mean but if you have to spend a lot of energy and time explaining it to me as of oh i know and how it is so is that so, was that the text that was for you for kids no like, hey, so that, no you. that's just an aside that's just showing you how there was other stuff going on in my exposition that's telling me hey we just we need to take this stuff seriously so believe it or not uh is actually uh um the god connect series hmm. lutheran house oh was nate uh pastor nathan he's 
So, you know, we're working through confirmation at St. Paul and he has these God, God connects videos. He says, I think you should sit down, just watch them, watch them as a family. Cause we're going to do this as a family too. I, we had talked about, I got a, another story that's really cool about this later, but um, coming into this as a family and watch those God connects videos. So we did sit down and watched it. So I think number eight is baptism. And as Gregory said, Stelzer, um, at the Lutheran hour talked about, and it's just the way he said it, that, the, that God creates faith in baptism and that faith is never a work that we do. And that, again, this is the way he said it. I'd heard Pastor Nathan say something kind of like it, but the God Connects video was so clear on this. And, and it's got the pictures and the video of, of you know, a baby receiving baptism or whatever. And again, it was light bulb moment. Like, oh my word, faith is never something that we do. And faith is being, again, I had that, remember that whiteboard, all the, you know, faith. I could see, you know, Titus 3, 5. Uh, you know, you've got faith in the mix. The, the baptism is creating faith. Baptism is, is providing faith. Uh, and so if that's happening and it's not a work of our, it's, it's not our own work. Oops. Sorry about this. Um, if it's not our work, then the whole infant question, then why not? Again, extra notes. Why not? Going back to Acts 2, 38 and 39 where it says a promise is for you and for your children. Oh my word. I don't know We're why. We're talking about sola, sola fide. And that was the other great thing about walking through the Wittenberg door. I finally found a group of people that were willing, were allowing sola fide to percolate through everything, everything. And we're talking systematic theology from top to bottom, from starting off with God, you know, and, and all the stuff going on with God, all the way down to last things. Solo fide, this permeates and saturates the whole systematic. And I was coming from a world in which solo fide only showed up when we needed it to. Hmm, that's interesting. Solo fide and baptism. Are you kidding me? Of course. This is going to happen now. I'm, <laughs> it's almost I'm as gonna... like so they want to use sola fide against baptism because they just assume baptism is a work. But infant right. baptism actually takes that away. And when Jesus says you have to become like a little child, in other words, you can't do anything. That's that's probably why our flesh is so resistant to infant baptism because it's like no, I even though I believe in grace alone, I'm still going to at least right. claim the decision or claim the repentance or claim something of me. But infant baptism won't let you do it. And you, well, so and this shows up obviously in the Baptist argument against infants. But the the more again, it you probably have to be on this side of the Wittenberg door, and that's something else I realized too. Now that I'm out of it, I can see a kind of a, a lot more. But how much decisionism percolates through their entire grid? And both mm -hmm. in the Baptist and the Reform world, mm -hmm. uh, decisionism yeah, along the way. Now, I existed in a Calvinistic world where we said we would actually give lip service to the fact that faith is a gift. Now, there were some that didn't believe that either, that that regeneration actually happens after faith. It doesn't happen at the same time as faith or regeneration. I was part of a crowd that that actually believed regeneration precedes faith. but decisionism is such a big deal and permeates everything well of course infants can't make a decision decisionism then shows up in sola fide so what sola fide gives something that is a gift is now taken away by the fact that we have to see the decision we have to hear the decision i grew up in a context in which we were constantly asking people do you know for sure when you asked jesus into your heart if you don't know the day and time you probably didn't i mean it was that bad um, I, no, even, I, even I before remember. I left, even before I left the reform world, I didn't, I didn't believe that anymore, but that's a big part the decisionism is just so pervasive. And so once I'm, you, I'm you, trying to connect the dots, I wonder if the, 
Like if you if you're ontologically gnostic, then you have to be ethically decisionist. Like, right. Oh, you absolutely. You separate the two. So the my the the way that my spirit has reality is by being able to make an impression on the on the on the material. And, and then you 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 do pull in again to be fair to them. You pull in the Holy Spirit who is operating on the inside and using all sorts of things to bring you to that decision, right? But then you still make the decision. Um, and again, this is why Luther called them enthusiasts because they were enthusiastic. Uh, they enthusiastically held too high of a position about what the Spirit was doing internally. Do you know, Chad, that, that the, so that passage I think is the the most profound theological insight outside of the scriptures, Luther in small called three, eight, where he says that enthusiasm is the root and strength of every heresy from Adam and Eve <laughs> to the Pope, to the Anabaptists, to right. every heresy. And we can extend it through whatever heresy we see today, gender heresy, right. marriage heresy, church heresy, incarnate. Every it's every heresy is enthusiasm. And he goes on to say the Holy Spirit only speaks through the word. That's where he emphasizes the extra notes. And that passage is the passage that I've had the most fights with Lutheran pastors about, where Luther says the spirit only works through the word. And they say, well, well, they, they, they don't they don't want to go all the way with Luther there. It's an amazing thing. Now, and understanding how that the spirit works through the word is also critical um in this whole extra nose thing uh yeah. to talk when you're talking to baptists that's also a big disconnect where that, that'd be another easy rabbit trail but the whole talk about how does the spirit work mm -hmm. and what is the spirit doing and how does he operate during the week outside of the sacraments and all right. that yeah yeah um the i there are some that they really want to embrace lutheranism they really like the grace they like the forgiveness that we offer but when we start talking about these spirit things they still want to hang on to their decisionism they still want to hang on to this idea that the spirit is constantly working on the inside to do all sorts of internal things with me and so i need to constantly be looking on the inside you know luther talked about also curving inward <laughs> um that happens in these conversations as yeah, well yeah yeah that in so, 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 I, I, so we got to land the plane so i that in say cur that curved in on yourself versus being able to kind of unfurl I, i'd love to just to have a little bit on that you also mentioned with your family and i want to make sure that everything that you you wanted to talk about uh we do so but so this in cravat is like the the this we get curved in on ourselves and in these theological conversations, we get curved in on ourselves. So, like, how did you fight through that defensiveness? Uh, and so say a little bit more about that, too. No, I think I, at some point, because we're you mentioned it earlier, we're constantly talking past ourselves um, when we're talking between Lutherans and Baptists or Lutherans and, and Presbyterians or the reform world. At some point, you just have to say, OK, we're talking about two different things here. Um, but my... I realized early on because I needed the extra notes because I needed baptism. I needed the table to, do, and I needed the word to do something to me because I'm a sinner. That the whole, cur it also told me much of, you know, so as I hear Luther talking about curving inward, I'm sitting there thinking, Oh man, this is my journey. This is my story. This is why I fought. This is why I had these, in this internal angst. You know, even his uh, dark night of the soul moments, I empathize with Luther. I know that. I've lived that. I've been there because of curving inward. I've got to find something inward. Now, I also was part of uh, a pocket of Reformed theology that emphasized that the Holy Spirit was operating through the word, operating internally and operating from the inside out. It wasn't external. It was from the inside out. That's still curving inward. Right. But at least at that time, that was my answer for all these bad things that I saw happening in terms of our theology, in terms of all the decisionism and all this stuff, that the Holy Spirit is actually operating internally, um, using the word internally to manifest all this outward. So faith and forgiveness and all the stuff that I'm experiencing mm -hmm. is all being is happening inside. I didn't re yet realize that that's also still problematic. <laughs> I haven't really solved the problem because I'm still a sinner. So extranos and Luther's talk of curving inward. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
That's why I struggled. And that's why I know people still struggle um, in, in the right. Baptist world with these things. It, it, there's, there is such a, there's a hope and a come. I mean, that's why this is like, uh, I, you know, I remember becoming Luther and I was so frustrated. All this stuff. But to realize now that, no, the, the Lord has a comfort for us. And that's the reason why we had to go through all this stuff, you and, and, and me and our families, so that now we can say, hey, to those people who are in that struggle and that brah, and the angst and the uncertainty and the, to say, look, there's there, the Lord does not want you to exist in that fear and trepidation. He has a, a comfort and an assurance for you. Um, here's, the, here's the other thing, and I want to make this before we leave this subject and thinking about that the fact that it doesn't come from inside of us and that even the faith um, is a gift, repentance is a gift. When it comes to the infant baptism and, and thinking about how sola fide is operational in uh, the baptismal waters for the infant, creating the faith, uh, creating the new life um, from outside. Now, the Baptist wants to say, yeah, but faith is something that, that is expressed. You know, say it's, it's, even those that want to say faith isn't something we do, that faith is a gift, they'll still say, but we, he, we still have to see the expression of faith. There's one passage. Remember how I said we're, we're big on, you know, one passage interpreting for the rest of the Bible. Romans 10, 9 in my world was the end all be all for all things salvific, which would exclude infants. Obviously, it obviously excludes all baptismal regeneration. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is in you will be saved. That has made the defining passage for Scripture, the end-all, be-all, that is the systematic, rather than that just being one verse of many. Rather than understanding that this is at the, actually at the back end of what Paul says in Romans 6, <laughs> <laughs> um and oh by the way faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god and you've got all this other stuff going on with baptism and the lord's table being word but romans 10 9 is why many can't get over because they'll just immediately run to that saying we don't need baptism we don't need the table all we have to do is confess and believe and we will be saved and as a lutheran coming alongside and that's why babies aren't saved because they can't do that they can't confess they can't believe and I hear have the God Connects video saying, who said that's what faith was? <laughs> mm -hmm. We've we've made faith a work at this point. Now we're back to the whole Rome and Reformed and Baptist discussion again. It, it is this idea that we're saved not by works in the in the evangelical mind is like, well, so we have to read re, it's like what's the very minimal thing that needs to happen for me to be saved? Right. So like the, the exclusion of works ends up being kind of a, a it's a they the, the theological tasks becomes a reductionistic task like that doesn't save that doesn't save that doesn't save that doesn't save and if we can keep saying that all these things don't save till we get back to the very so like faith okay that's all that saves and everything else is reduced but the the bible is not that way it's like faith saves the word saves baptism saves it's a it's a maximal look, look at salvation it's just as none of those things are your works they're all god's works it's well, you that's excluded, not the stuff. One of the things that that God Connects videos did for me, though, and subsequent study later on, I've been mean, through the SMP program now. So, but recognizing that in Romans 10 9, what we've done in the reform world and the Baptist world is there's causal, the cause and effect, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that the mm -hmm. confession. Uh, is what makes us saved. Right, right, the right, the right. belief is what makes us saved. Uh, you know what? I don't think you can have cause and effect there because now it's a work. The you know, moment we have cause and and what's funny again, remember I said reading Luther five hundred years ago, he's warning about the whole cause and effect stuff. And we haven't brought it up yet, but Luther, this is another light bulb moment stuff for me, was constantly picking at this scholastic and the scholasticism that was going on where people thought they could uh, figure things out and they always had to have a logical order. One of the things I embraced even before coming into the Lutheran world was paradox. I actually had a reform guy tell me shortly before I left the reform world that there's no such thing as paradox. 
And that's true for a lot of reformed people, a lot of Baptists. They don't believe it. And I came to believe, you know what? There's a lot of both and going on here in the Bible. There's a lot of both and going on in our salvation. Um, so this whole cause and effect thing, this logic that they want to apply happens at Romans 10, 9, where you, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, then you'll have salvation. Rather than it all happening at the same time, and Luther saying, no, salvation is what is actually creating the confession, and salvation is actually what is creating the belief for the salvation. Great. That's great. All right, Chad, I'm going to land this plane, but what? So, all right. before we do, what um, what have not you said that you want to say? There's two, well, there's a couple of things. You're talking about my family, uh, and the, this is what makes me so passionate about being a pastor here at the table of Los Fresnos. And as a pastor, you know, one of the things at the table is we're really aimed uh, and we have intentionally uh, tried to uh, reach people that are what well, the sociologists and what our Christian sociologists call the de-churched. Um, those that used to go to church are no longer going to church. And our whole thing is, hey, the church is, is for us. Uh, what is it that, you know, how can we communicate what we have to you? One of the reasons why I'm so passionate about doing that is because of these, these, the church have been hurt by church. And I know from my own experience that some of the, and I'll use the word damage, the damage that's done by this decisionism, by this constant pursuit of the hidden God, which is also part of all this um leaves people on this hamster wheel trying to uh, make sure that they're always pleasing pleasing god or, or always making sure that they have god's pleasure rather than understanding that they always have god's pleasure that jesus is always forgiven um that affected my family in ways that i hadn't been begun to comprehend as i'm making this move from the reform world to the lutheran world and i it's a i've okay this with my son i've told this story many times uh, we're driving somewhere and i'm having this conversation i said look this sunday uh your mother and i are joining saint paul lutheran in harlingen and i would like to do this as a family i'm not going to make he was 15 or 16 at the time i was just like i understand um i, I want you to make the decision uh i'm not going to drag you into this but at the same time i'd like you to I'd like you to make this journey with us. I'd like you to be there. I think this is good for all of us. His comment to me was, Dan, I'm not good enough to be a Lutheran. And I was just, I just, I, I, I lost it. I, it was like all of my past came flooding into that moment. And I'm sitting there thinking, what have I done? My son, Luke, he thinks he's got to do something. And I've had him in this world, this, this reformed universe that has taught him that he's got to somehow earn his way into church. And he, you know, you talk to Luke and he, he would say, he knows that's, that's not true and that that's not what salvation is, but it's coming out of his mouth. And so that is part of my passion. I don't ever want anyone who ever comes to the table to think that this treasure that we have isn't for them. Um, and that, that, there, that there's ever a moment which God does not love them. You said it earlier. I mean, it was another one of those light bulb moments as reformed were trained from the little child up, that first question, the catechism. Uh, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And then realizing now, no, 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 we can never do that in a zillion years. Christ had to do all of that for us. So it's baked into the system. And so now as a pastor, I want to make sure that my, our people at the table, that myself, my family, that we all understand that Jesus wants us that Jesus loves us, that he left heaven 
because of me. You know, one of the songs that we didn't sing or we kind of, uh, in fact, we, <laughs> one of the churches I uh, was a pastor at in the past in my former world, we made them change the words. Michael W. Smith's above all, you know, above all <laughs> uh, that, they, that my thought, he thought of me above all at the cross. And we made people change that. That's no, he was thinking about his own glory. He's thinking about the glory of God. You know, John 17, we're going to run that all day. And realizing how wrong that is to be telling people that. No, 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 no. Jesus did. That he wants you. He wants you so bad that he left heaven for you. I get to tell my people that every week because of this journey into Lutheranism. That's great. So, Chet, thank you. That's so great. Thank you. Yeah. That's the... I, um. That was the thing. And and then the other thing that I've seen since coming into the Lutheran world, I just want to leave us with this. And this is something I'm probably going to talk about next week. And that is how bad do we want this? Yeah. Uh, because I think um, I'm honored. I love spending time with the people that I call cradle to grave Lutherans. <laughs> They've been in this all their lives, but I also see some uh, apathy if I can say that, uh, a lot of times it seems that I'm in conversations where it just seems like we're content preaching to the choir and people wouldn't say that. I think people do have a love for the lost. They do have a love for, for wanting their neighbor that, that might be de-churched to, to come to church, but we have so many barriers and so many things. I, I've had this discussion, you know, a lot of the materials that we, we crank out, uh, you know, CPH, uh, is, is, as part of this discussion as well you know i picked up a book early on in my journey even at saint paul and i'm looking at this book and and i'm thinking this doesn't speak to me uh, this is using language i don't understand it was really it may be lutheranism 101 it may be how to be a lutheran or whatever but it it's only talking to lutherans it's really used in confirmation it's not really apologetic it's not it's not saying things i need to hear as a baptist who's kicking the tires of the lutheran church and so I think we set up barriers at times that are unintentional, um, but they're there nevertheless. And I just wonder how bad we want it. How bad do we, how bad do we want others to bring others along in this this treasure that we have, this treasure that Jesus has has brought me into. So that's a good question uh, to end on it. But I, you know, it's, this when Jesus calls us to be he calls the disciples to be fishers of men. Right. I always think the first thing we have to remember is that before we're called to be fishers, we're called to be fish. <laughs> we, <laughs> we are the caught. <laughs> and I think the more we rejoice in right. being the caught, the more right. that it's right. like, Hey, come and yeah. be in this net yeah. with me. Yeah. And we, and, and so, and the Lord is, you know, the Lord is, is doing his thing as he, he's, he's hooking all of us and dragging us all in. So. Well, you said it earlier, come be in this joy. Yeah, right. That's right. We have something that really joy. wonderful. That's kind of how the like the 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 whole preaching of the gospel is for it's like, hey, this is pretty cool. I, I mean, I this is how I think of as a preacher. I'm like, uh, you open the Bible and I'm like, that's pretty cool. And then when I go talk to the pastors and I open up the book of Concord, and I'm like, that's pretty cool. And then you go to church and you look you point to the altar and like body and blood. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's, and so when you want people to drive by their church and tell their neighbor, hey, that church, that's pretty cool. You know, I mean, this is an amazing, it's a, that, that here, nowhere, I mean, you get the law everywhere. You get death and dying everywhere, but here's life and salvation and the forgiveness of sins and the, and the truth that God is not mad at us because of the, because of the death of his son on the cross. We can talk a law all day long, but forgiveness in the gospel yeah, uh, that's the stuff we have to remember how Luther says like this, that Jesus instituted his church so that we would receive there nothing. I remember one time one of my elders said, that's about right, Pastor. That's why. <laughs> but no, said, hey, don't stop in the middle of the sentence. We, we instituted his church so that we daily receive there nothing but the pure, unadulterated forgiveness yeah. of all of our sins. Yeah. So yeah. here's where you go to get a good conscience. I always, you know how they have the good feet store. I always wanted to put like a, a sign outside of the church that the good conscience store. <laughs> right. 
That's so great. Hey, Chad, I appreciate it. Um, thank you for this conversation. This is oh, thank wonderful. you for allowing me to tell my story. <laughs> yeah, it's really right. God be praised. And uh, and I know we'll, there's so much more to talk about. So we'll have to do this again sometime. We will. Absolutely. Anytime. And thanks, everyone, for watching. God's peace be with you.